Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Uh, for those watching at this time, we welcome you from the Hallandale Church of God Seventh Day uh, online services. Uh, today we are not going to have music. We, we have been having some difficulties with uh, with the sound, so we just decided to forego the music at this time. Uh, we pray for all those that are watching us from uh, uh, from home, from here, from uh, Chattanooga, uh, West Virginia, uh, uh, anywhere from Tennessee or Georgia. Uh, welcome, and uh, and for the rest of them, we we pray that uh, God is watching over you, that everything is gonna go is going well, and we know that this is a very hard time of. Um, this social distancing, but but we have to remember that God is 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 sovereign, that He is watching after us, and uh, we should have no no fear. Uh, I would like to read for you, and if you can join me at home, at Psalms eight, um, and after that we'll have Brother Scott Gilbert to lead us in prayer, and after him it will be Pastor Wayne giving us the message. So if you can uh, open your Bibles with me, we're going to read Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sacraments have you ordained strength because of, of your enemies, um, that you might still, might you still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visited him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the, of the sea. And whatsoever passes through the path of the seas, O oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You need to remember that God is in control, that um, God gives us every day what we need, just like he did for the children of Israel, uh, the manna he gave them one day at a time. So we need to look up and ask him to give us what we need, the peace that only comes from him for today, not for tomorrow. Today, tomorrow is going to look after himself. So at this time... We'll have Brother Scott to give us, uh, to lead us into a uh, time of prayer. Thank you, Zayda. Uh, good morning. Uh, um, <clears throat> let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. Father, I thank you for that Psalms. Father, I thank you for your promises, God. I thank you that, as Isaiah said, Father, that you you will never leave us nor forsake us, Father. You even promised that if we will draw nigh to you, that you will draw nigh to us. And so, Father, I thank you for those written promises. Father, I thank you for uh, the prophets of old, uh, uh, Father, ones that, that accepted your call, the ones that lived, that fleshed out, lived out a relationship with you. Father, how you, you are always there. Father, e even when we fall. Father, even when we stumble. Father, even when we sin. Father, that if we'll forsake that sin. Father, that we will truly repent. Father, which is turn away. Father, that you're there. You're a loving Father that continually wants to lead God and direct us, Father, through every second of every day. Father, in good times, Father, in bad times, in trials and tribulations, Father, you are our Papa, Father. Abba, Father, Father, I thank you for that comfort and that strength, Father. I thank you, Father, that only you, Father, that can even deposit that faith, Father, and that hope, Father. It's you drawing us. Father, nigh to you, Father, that you draw us, Father, to begin that relationship, Father, and I thank you for that. Father, I thank you for, as she was reading, Father, talking about your creation, Father, I thank you for the beautiful day that we have today, Father, it is amazing, Father, when we just slow down, Father, and inhale, take a big, deep breath and see, especially here in Alabama, Father, all the 
new blooms. Father, the flowers, the trees, Father, it is simply amazing, Father. And as you, right, as during creation, Father, it was very good, Father, and it was good. Father, and I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for the blooms. I thank you that it's a promise of fruit to come, Father. Some trees are going to yield uh, apples and such, Father, and berries, Father. Some's going to yield nuts, Father. Some's going to yield acorns for deers and squirrels. And uh, Father, and I thank you for that, Father, that you care, Father, for every part of your creation, Father, and that also spiritually, Father, we can sort of correlate that, Father, with the fruits of the Spirit, Father. Father, in the tree of life, Father, I thank you for the tree of life. I thank you for the vine. I thank you for Jesus, Father, that if we'll stay connected to that vine, Father, as John 5 talks about, Father, that, 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 that'll bring forth fruit in our life, Father, and that, and that if we're not connected to that vine, Father, apart from you, Father Messiah said that we can absolutely do nothing. So, Father, help us to, to meditate upon you and your ways, Father. Yes, we have to go to work. Yes, we have to do these different things, Father, but help us to so know that you empower us to keep our hearts and minds stayed and fixed on you. Father, during this time of corona, Father, that we can, yes, we can take the news. Yes, we can take the the guidelines and the boundaries and do all that. We can apply some of that as wisdom, Father, but ultimately, Father, help us to rest in you, rest that you're far above all principalities and powers. And there's rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual weakness in high places. You're far above all viruses and bacteria. Father, and I thank you for that. So help us to go forth in power and strength, Father, in a body, soul, and spirit, to do the things that we can do in the physical realm. But, Father, most of all, Father, that we will eat a healthy and abundant appetite, appetite of spiritual food, Father, that feeds that inner man, Father, that, that we can see the solution that no matter what's coming our way, no matter what's forecasted, Father, even the, the inclement weather, Father, that possibly coming tomorrow, Father, in the south, Father, I pray that you would spare us, Father, that you would turn the weather, Father, that you would, if we have to go through the storm, Father, that you will lead God and direct us, but most of all, that you have promised to lead and guide and direct us. So, Father, help us to keep our ear to the ground, so to speak, Father. Help us to practice, Father, when times are good, knowing your voice, learning your voice, knowing knowing your character and your personality. So, Father, we can even take shelter when it's time to take shelter, Father, but just rest, Father, that our mind, that the hormones that our mind secrete, Father, when we're in stress, Father, we don't want that. Father, your your word says to, to think upon things which is good and perfect and of lovely and of good rapport, any praise, any virtue, think on these things. Father, you knew this way back when, even before science proved that when we think upon good things, when we think upon your goodness, when we shift our mind, our carnal mind, the things that are true, Father, that our body secretes hormones, that makes us feel good, that gives us joy, that strengthens our immune system. Father, I thank you for that revelation. Father, and if people that are hearing me pray this prayer, Father, and to quote your word, Father, that, that they would begin to believe it, Father, that they would put it in practical application. Father, everything that you ask man to do or instruct him to do, Father, is profitable, body, soul, and spirit. Father, the only thing that I personally think that separates those three is your word and death. Father, so I thank you for that, Father. So, Father, I focus my attention on, uh, I want to ask for Manuel, Father, Zaida's cousin. Father, he's in New Jersey. Father, I pray that you would heal him, Father, that you would protect him, Father. You would protect his his wife and his kids, Father, as he's been diagnosed with coronavirus. Father, I pray that, that he's going to get to the other side. Father, I pray that you would strengthen him, Father. You would show him what to do. You'd send labors in his path, Father. If he seeks medical attention, Father, I pray that you would supernaturally move in that situation, that, that they would do the things that would truly get him to a state uh, of well-being, Father, and that he would, that, and when he's on the other side, Father, that he'd give you the glory and the honor, Father. I don't know his heart and mind. 
his family situation, Father, but I just pray that you would show yourself mighty in their situation, Father, that you would draw them close to you, Father, and they would choose to draw close to you, Father, and they'd draw close to one another. So, Father, I thank you for that, Father. Once again, I pray for our leaders, Father, our president, the vice president, everybody that's involved, Father, I just pray that they would be led by your spirit, Father. If any of them don't know you personally, Father, I pray that you'd convict them. Father, I pray that, that we would be a true Christian nation, Father, that we would true uphold a true one and only living God, Father, that sent his son, Father, to set any and everybody that would believe and repent of their sin, Father, that you would set us free from the law of sin and death, Father, that we may have life abundant here, Father, and that we would have life eternally. So, Father, I do say a, a pray a special prayer once again, Father, for the weather that's possibly coming, Father. I just pray that 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 you protect us all, Father. You would uh, show us what to do, Father. Help us to be wise, Father, but also help us to be full of faith. So, Father, help us also, Father, to uh, <clears throat> um, as believers, Father, help us. Not just in rough times, Father, but in all times, Father, help me, Father, and us as believers, Father, to truly slow down, Father, and, and, and truly look for opportunities to share your good news, Father, with, with, with other believers, Father, but also, first and foremost, Father, with your lost sheep, Father, with, with people that do not know the free pardon of sin that do not know the peace of being able to lay your head down at night, Father, and to take no anxious thought for tomorrow. So, Father, help us to share that good news. Father, you hope that all men are redeemed. Father, your word says, as I quoted a couple of Sabbaths ago, Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him would should not perish but have eternal life. So, Father, I thank you once again for those promises, Father. I pray for um, folks that are listening, Father. I just pray that you know every situation. Father, you know every heart and mind. So I pray that your spirit, Father, would comfort those, Father, ones that need convicted, convict them, Father, of, uh, of, of sin, Father. Father, uh, ones that need encouragement, Father, I pray that you would encourage them, Father, your spirit, Jesus referred to it as the comforter, Father. It can be a comforter. It can be a business partner, Father. You, Your spirit knows all things and all powerful, but it's also a gentleman. Father, help us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, Father. Help us to not have words contrary to faith or corrupt communication to proceed out of our mouth. Father, I pray that you teach our tongues, teach our hearts, Father, that you may be honored and glorified, Father, that, that our lives would show that a an invisible, unseen God is real and worth trusting. So, Father, I pray for Pastor Wayne as he's about to come. Father, I pray that you would encourage him, strengthen him. Father, you would fill him with love and joy, Father. And I pray that your message, the seed that, that you're going to sow through him, Father, would that take root in our hearts, Father. Father, and help us to be good stewards of our ground, Father. We would till it up, Father, that we would have fertile soil. Father, as your word is pray, preach, taught, and sing. Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's one. Thank you, Aaron, for that time of, of prayer. Uh, I mean, Scott, I'm sorry. Thank you, Aaron, for also helping uh, us get our uh, website again set up for this morning. Thank you to Jason who uh, led out with the uh, youth for their uh, uh, class they had this morning. I also want you to be reminded to write down your numbers for your chapters for when this is all over, we can write down and get that chart filled up. So I want you to consider that. We celebrated the Lord's Supper this week. And uh, it is good to be reminded in our hearts and our minds of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, and also to remember that the Lord's Supper, which led us to the crucifixion, which led us also now to the great event, which would have been today, uh, those many years ago, Jesus' resurrection coming in the later afternoon. It, it brings excitement, especially when we read in Luke, the 24th chapter. If we were to look there for a moment and 
and see the excitement of all of a sudden the tomb where the stone is rolled away and then all of a sudden there are angels present there and for the people Mary and for the disciples to all of a sudden recognize Jesus is gone and uh, the excitement that was there the understanding finally that was uh, opened up to their hearts and minds where they were mourning and, and unsure of what was going to happen all of a sudden there's great grace and joy uh, as the brightness of these angels are are telling the world that uh, the Savior had risen from the grave and as, as we consider uh, my uh, message this morning I'm hoping that all of you got the uh, sermon notes in your email this morning about the empty tomb I would like to speak about our own tomb and what do you mean by that I would like to go through three points with you this morning point number one we are born in and live in that tomb of death we are born in and live in that tomb of death I'm talking about carnally Point number two, one day we awake and Jesus has an offer. One day we awake and Jesus has an offer. And point number three, the danger of going back to the tomb. The danger of going back to the tomb. So I'm going to go over point one and it's going to be two sub points on number one and one a is we are born in the tomb that may sound quite shocking to many of us but the truth is we are spiritually born dead we are born in a tomb we don't have any spiritual life we do not know God we don't know the spiritual life so we are born dead in this life and like I'm trying to represent we're born in a tomb we are apart from God. All the world that we know about or uh, understand is my desires and my being satisfied. We grow up and we expect in the world that it's the world's job to please us. We should have friends that serve us, teachers that will admire our uncanny intellectual ability. Then we continue to grow with the assumption that the world owes us a living. The world should be able to give me a job. I didn't even have to go out and find that job. The world should give me a job and a good paying job besides that. That the world should give me a beautiful wife and children, a beautiful home and a wonderful car. Uh, this is the way the natural world is. This is where our carnal ideas are. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of that old Walt Disney cartoon where uh, the grasshopper kept jumping around and singing, the world owes me a living. And I remember that from a long time ago, and here was the ant preparing for the coming winter, and the, the grasshopper was understanding, hey, the world owes me a living. And I should also have a great circle of friends who are going to uh, think I'm one of the greatest guys around. Uh, all around me, the world is my desire, and that is the tomb that I live in. And it's a tomb. So we are comfortable in our tomb. We don't want anything to be changed. Uh, we don't want to hear the message of the gospel of the kingdom because I'm comfortable the way I am. You give me what I want. You satisfy my needs and I'm going to stay in this tomb the rest of my life. Uh, and we have the idea also, well, the, the, the church is, is a bunch of hypocrites. We're looking for any excuse we can have to continue to live our life. Don't you tell me that I'm dying. Uh, in the physical life. I don't want to hear it. Don't you tell me that I'm dead spiritually. I don't want to hear it. I just want to relax, eat and drink. Don't worry about tomorrow. I just want to have what I want today. That's the way we are in our tomb. And you know what I thought about that was some other person that said, what is the greatest prison you can uh, create? And many people came up, but one was the idea of we'll have a prison underwater so far down underneath that if they tried to get out there they would die trying to get to the surface uh, they had all these different ideas about 12 or 15 feet uh, cement encasement all around the prison so you never could get out of there and then they finally came to what was the greatest prison it's the prison in which you don't know you're in prison 
and you don't want to escape. You're happy in that. And that's what our tomb is. That's what the devil wants us to believe. You're happy. You don't need anything. You don't need Christianity. You don't need Jesus Christ. You've got your car. You've got a full refrigerator. You've got everything you need. Everything is good. Let me go to John, the third chapter, verse 19. John 3 and verse 19. John 3 and verse 19. It says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And Jesus is, of course, referring to himself. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So don't you tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. You just let me live my life the way I want to. You just live your life the way you want to. So this is what Jesus was, was, was stating. Hey, this is the problem. We want... Our life, the way we want to, I'm going to live in my tomb, just leave me alone. And let's look at that, let's look at the opposite side of the coin on this. And the opposite uh, side of the coin is this, there are people who are raised in the church, they follow the steps of their parents and friends in church, but they may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But they are born, they're faithful, they go to the, the church every weekend, they give, their parents teach them to give tithe. Their parents teach them to go to Bible study, whatever day of the week that is. They do all of these things. That does not mean that they're saved. We may even have been raised in a good, fine Christian family. That still does not mean I'm a Christian. That still doesn't mean that I know God. You cannot make a decision one day on your own without God saying, Well, I think today I'm going to become a Christian. We can't do that. Why? Because Jesus himself told us, no man can come unto the Father unless what? Unless he draw him. So we can't even come to salvation. That is a miracle in itself. We're thinking, well, where are the miracles of God this day? Look in the mirror. You're a miracle. Because you have found salvation. That's the greatest miracle of all. It wasn't Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead or Jesus taking ten men that were lepers and cleansing them all at once. The greatest miracle is when Jesus comes into our life and we start to realize there's a problem here. When the, when the, the uh, conviction of the Spirit says, take a look at your life, see what's going on there. Unfortunately, we have many uh, people who tell us, just say this simple prayer, and when you have finished the prayer, and if you really, really, really believe, then you're saved. There are untold thousands who are walking on this earth who believe that they are saved when they're not. I read we must be drawn by God and by God's Spirit to come to the place where there's conviction in my heart. Otherwise, if we just say, well, I'm just going to say a simple prayer and somehow God's going to uh, save me uh, just the way I am. We don't invite God into a mess that is our lives. God comes and cleans out the mess. Out of our hearts, out of our lives, so that we are a clean vessel for God to dwell in. And then, and, and the problem is, there are more people after a year of, of, of making this so-called prayer and statement, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to live for Jesus from now on. There are statistics that prove that after a year, most people who do that don't even go to church anymore, don't read their Bible, don't pray anymore. Uh, because we have been given a formula instead of given a Savior. So we need to realize we need Jesus Christ. We don't need someone's prayer just to pray that we need to have Jesus in our hearts and our lives. Matthew 23, verse 27. Let's turn there for a moment. Matthew 23 and verse 27. We don't realize sometimes our condition that we're in, and Jesus came to reveal that. Matthew 23 and verse 27, and it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Why? For you are like unto whited sepulchres. We're talking about your tomb. You're like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful on, uh, outward, 
but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. And I want to take that kind of an idea and say, before we come to Jesus Christ, we may look and say, well, look, he's got a beautiful house, three-car garage. Look at all these beautiful things he has. You may have beautiful things, but you may be a dead man walking. So we need to realize that our tomb is a dangerous place and yet there are many people living in their tombs, happy in their tombs. And their tombs may be dark and dank and, and uh, humid and, and uh, it's just a horrible place. But you know what? People get used to that. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians, the second chapter. Here's where I'd like to base a lot of my scripture on this morning is Ephesians 2. And you know another thought here before I go into Ephesians 2 is that you remember... In one of the scriptures, I believe that was found in Mark, the fifth chapter. Read that sometimes. Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. Jesus went over the other, sea, the other side of the sea, went from Galilee over to the Gentile side of where the Sea of Galilee was. And there met him what? It says a man from the tombs. And what does it say about that man? He lived in those tombs. He lived there. He cried out, it says in another place, that he would be mourning in those tombs. They would try to chain him, and they couldn't keep him bound, but he lived in those tombs until Jesus came, and then here that man came forward and bowed down before him, and when Jesus got through with that man, the demons were out of his life, and he was a believer. And what is awesome about that is he says, Jesus, I'm going to go with you. I want to go back to your your, your place where you're dwelling, I want to be with you. And Jesus said, no, I want you to go and tell the people what God has done for you. We need to realize that, brethren. We need uh, to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to realize before we come to Christ, we're living in tombs. We are dead people walking. So Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3, let's go. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3. And you have he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And that's where we are without Jesus. When we are living in a tomb, we are dead. We don't know God. We don't know the spiritual life. All we know is this hunger in us to try and find satisfaction. Verse 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. And verse 1, going back, that says, You are dead in your trespasses. According to the prince of the power of the air, the devil is the one who convinces us. You don't need Jesus. Just have a car, just have a home, have a family. That's all you need. Or alcohol or drugs, whatever it might be. The Spirit now worketh in the children of disobedience. So we see that we are dead in our trespasses. But here comes the Spirit of God and awakens in us the truth that we are dead people. Verse 3, among, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts or the desires of our flesh. And isn't it our desires that govern us, that uh, control us? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So we were under the condemnation of sin in our hearts and our lives, living, sometimes hiding in these tombs. So we live in that tomb. And you know, brother, that's the part about it. We don't recognize it. We don't recognize that we are chained to something, but we are. So let us understand that we as sinners do not even know the death sentence. And if we do hear about this death sentence, we quickly dismiss it because we don't know one of that. We just want my life the way my life needs to be, and you worry about your own life. So, uh, which is amazing to me, we don't want to know. Look at how many times Jesus was trying to deal with people and say, you know what, your life is going to lead you to death and destruction. They didn't want to know about that. Look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of, of their day. They didn't want to hear about it. They just wanted their life the way it was. They wanted their position. They wanted their money. And Jesus says, you've got it all wrong. <clears throat> we are in a type of a stupor. We eat and drink, and tomorrow, if we die, we die. 
We need to fight against that idea. We need to realize that the Lord of life is calling us to life. So that was uh, point uh, B on that. We live in that tomb. Now let's go to point number two. So point number one, one A was we're born in that tomb. We're born into sin. We are not born righteous people. We're not born these grace-filled people. We are born sinners. And point number two, or point B, I'm sorry, uh, number one is we live in that tomb. We're happy to live in that tomb. We're happy to be there. Now let's go to point number two. And 2A says one day we recognize our predicament. So in that little line on there, if you're following that along with the notes that I sent you this morning, it is one day we recognize our predicament, or if you want to say your situation. And what is uh, the good news about this is, one day we wake up, we, we, we hear a Billy Graham message, or someone is on TV and starts talking about salvation, or someone knocks on our door and talks to us about salvation, or we receive something in the mail that uh, catches our interest, and we realize we are sinners. We are in need of grace. And we realize where we have been all our lives is an empty, not quite empty tomb, because we're in that tomb. But we're in a tomb. And we're living day after day with the death sentence on us. But one day, by God's grace and that awesome awakening, we realize and we see who we are and we become convicted by the Spirit of God to realize that we need more than what we have and what we need is that hope, that glimmer of hope. And what is great is when the Spirit of God starts to work in our lives, we start to see that the Spirit of God is guiding us towards that place where we are going to surrender our hearts and lives, come and ask in a repentant spirit, a sorrowful spirit, I am sorry, dear God, for all my sin that I have done, for the people that I have hurt, for putting Jesus on that cross. We come to that recognition. And then, let's go to Ephesians 2, let's stay there, and verses 4 and 5. So it's a process. Verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins. You see, we're talking about living in the tomb. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us. Now that is what happens to us. We don't come to God. We're running away from God as fast as we can. And when the Spirit of God starts to take a hold of our lives, we are quickened. We are awakened out of the dead sleep that we're in spiritually to the realization that there is a God who loves and cares for us, and that we need God. So, but God who is rich, let's go verse 5 again, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. I cannot do works enough for God to one day say, okay, I'm going to save you. Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. God calls us as sinful people to come to righteousness. And we do that by coming and proclaiming, I was, I'm a sinner and I'm asking God for forgiveness and God does forgive us. And he shows us out of that tomb a beautiful, sunny, light day. And brethren, when we look where we were in that cold, dark cave, whatever it is of the tomb we're in, and we can see the lights shining and the sunshine, Brethren, it's a beautiful experience. It's a beautiful thing to have. So one day we recognize our predicament, but the Spirit of God moves us to do something. And what that is, is point B. On number two, Jesus makes us an offer. Jesus makes us an offer. Let's quickly turn to John 5, verses 5 and 6. John 5, 5 and 6. Okay. John 5, verses 5 and 6. This is speaking about a man who was sick 
And as we understand, for 38 years, he was uh, with some kind of a palsy or some kind of paralysis where he couldn't get up and walk on his own. And it says in John 5, verse 5, And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? Uh, let me put it also in our modern vernacular. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you tired of being there all these years in that condition? And that's the way Jesus is with us. When the Spirit of God begins to move in our hearts and lives, Jesus says, do you want a new life? Do you want a new hope? Do you want something new other than what you have? He gives this offer. Jesus never forces the gospel on any man. It is an offer to say to us, do you want life eternal? Do you want better than what you have right now? And that is important for us to realize. Uh, we do not come to Jesus on our own. It is by the Spirit of God that he draws us in love to that point where we say, yes, Lord, I see where I am, and I don't want to live the way I want to, uh, that I have anymore. Let's go back to Ephesians 2, verses 6 to 10. So Jesus makes us an offer. Jesus makes us an offer, an offer. It is instead of death, I'm offering you life. And brethren, that is, that is the greatest offer we can have. So Ephesians 2, verses 6 through 10. Ephesians 2, 6 through 10. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When we come to salvation and we experience that joy of the sins gone, and brethren, I believe it's a, it's a physical thing you can know, a spiritual thing you can understand one day, that life has changed. And it says he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We've gone from the tomb to where? It says to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer in the tomb of death. I am in a place of life. And that is awesome. And then verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved. Through faith. Jason was talking about that with the youth class this morning. Talking about that faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So when we need salvation, God gives it to us freely. We don't have to climb the highest mountain. We don't have to do some almost impossible task to receive grace. It is a gift. And what a gift it is. Verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, when we come to that saving grace, we leave that empty tomb, we come out and we see life and we start living in life, God gives us a work to do, and that is to do what? Share what he has done in my life and to give it to someone else. And brethren, that is hard sometimes, it's a struggle, but brethren, we need to do that because it's truth. And it's truth that people need to hear. But I want to say what a hallelujah experience it is when you sense in your being the sin's gone. It is no more having to go to bed at night with the dread of dying. Because when we experience that new hope and we have the empty tomb experience as we saw Jesus' tomb was empty, we see that our tomb is empty. And we are living in the spirit of the awesome, almighty God. And what an experience that is. So, number one was, we need to realize that we are born in a tomb, and we live in that tomb. And then point number two, we recognize one day our predicament, and Jesus makes us an offer. And now point number three, the danger of going back to the tomb. And it's... It, when we're just discussing the excitement and the joy of, of experiencing Jesus in our hearts and our lives, the question should be asked immediately, why do I want to go back to that dead, ugly place where I lived? And yet, brethren, you're going to find out through scriptures that Jesus tells us there are many people that do that. 
Let's go to uh, Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. And then we'll go to some words that Jesus says. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. Hebrews, the 6th chapter, verses 4 to 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, we would take from that saved, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, they, they experienced salvation, and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. You cannot receive that Holy Spirit until you are saved. Until God has cleansed you out from the inside out, then God puts his Holy Spirit in you. So we're seeing that this is a person who is in a safe condition and have tasted the good word, verse 5, of God and of the powers of the world to come. And now look what verse 6 says. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. Now, in Hebrews, this particular aspect is talking about Jews who experienced grace through Jesus Christ our Lord that all of a sudden turned back to Judaism where there was no Jesus. So we can see that people can go back to something that's dead. And we don't want to do that. Now let's look at John 6, verse 67. John 6, and verse 67, brethren, we have to work daily in our hearts and our minds to be reading the word of God, to be in prayer, because you can fall away from the gospel. You can fall away from salvation. John 6, verse 67. Now actually, let's go back to verse 66. John 6, start with verse 66. From that time, because his teaching was so demanding and so hard on people sometimes that from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You see that? When they were walking with Jesus, brethren, I believe they were walking in light and they were being led to life. And then verse 67 says, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? That happens. It's amazing to me, but brethren, we all can be in danger of losing our salvation when we stop reading the Word of God, when we stop going to church, when we stop our prayer life, when we pull away from God and go back to that tomb we lived in before, we're going back into a dead man's life. It can happen, brethren, and it happens more often than we know. Now, I want to end our message this morning, and I'm thankful for the time that I've had with you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And brethren, I am hoping that you and I can experience, and we need uh, refreshing times from the Lord to come upon our lives to remind us of the joy that we have. We need to be renewed. We need to be having revival in our hearts and lives, brethren. And you are the one who is supposed to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, the Apostle Paul says. So, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead, those who are in tombs, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now we're talking about a, the physical, literal tomb when a person dies here. We will all be raised. For this corruptible, that means this fleshly, must put on the incorruption. That's these new resurrection bodies that we are promised. And even it said that we will receive a body as his body, the Apostle Paul tells us. And the dead shall put on, and this raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, here we go now, the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We're no longer worried about that old tomb that we were in because when we come to Jesus Christ, we have that newness in our spiritual 
inner life. But when Jesus comes again, we have that new life in new bodies. I'm reminded of a, a song uh, the cathedrals would like to sing, I have a new body, I have a new life. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You live in that tomb, you're living in sin. You're living under the law. But thanks be to God, verse 57, which gives us the what? It says the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. That means in our Christian life, we need to be consistent and we need to be faithful in our life, brethren. Be steadfast, unmovable. That means if coronavirus is, is around or if there's bad weather around, we are unmovable. Why? Because we're trusting in our God, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, brethren, we're given a... a, a and invitation, we're given encouragement that we need to share that good life, that new life with others Lord and, and, and we just ask that God will help us to do that especially in this time of the coronavirus when there's such a, a, a bad sense about us these are people who need to hear that there is life beyond an empty tomb and that's what we want so we're going to close with a prayer at this time Father in heaven, we are thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to bring us out of the tomb, out of the place where death was. You gave us life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You saved us by Jesus on the cross. You give us hope by reading the word of God and help us to be strong in the word daily and in prayer and in faithful going to church that we can encourage one another and in our community people that we may work with on the job, that they're going to look at us and see that we are not dead men walking, but we have the risen Savior living in our hearts and our lives. And that light that lightens a dark world, and we need that, dear Lord God. So we pray that you'll be with us. Guide us and direct us, dear Lord. Help us to be able to share that good news, because it is good news. We don't want to hide in a tomb anymore. We want to be alive living for Christ. So bless and be with our people this week. Protect every family, every individual that's watching this at this time with your grace and your mercy and your peace. Keep us all safe from this coronavirus. Keep us safe, Lord. You know, it was talked about earlier that there's supposed to be some bad weather in the Alabama weather and, and elsewhere. We just pray your grace and mercy to be with us too for protection and safety. And Lord, let us find a home in that eternal kingdom with a new body and a new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you for watching.